Welcome to The Teaching Curve, a podcast exploring the pedagogy of global politics and international studies, produced under the auspices of the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative of the International Studies Association and made available through ISA's Professional Resource Center. I'm Jamie Free, Associate Provost and Professor of Global Politics at Bridgewater College. Each episode of The Teaching Curve is a conversation with a thoughtful and engaged teacher of global politics. The goal is to celebrate and inspire pedagogical creativity by finding connections between tactics, strategies, and attitudes that can facilitate good teaching. Better conversations about teaching lead to better teaching. Today's conversation is with Dr. Luba levin Banchik, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Cal State University, San Bernardino, and the 2023 recipient of ISA's Deborah Gurner Award for Innovative Teaching. Luba has published on using simulations and other active learning techniques and is a leader in the ISA West region. Our conversation explores attitudes and policies that allow for mistakes and even failures as mechanisms to inspire student learning, how to use active learning techniques such as jigsaw exercises to get students both to learn new material and teach it to each other, and options for framing the work required to build active learning tactics into the classes in terms of the returns on those investments. Luba levin Banchik, welcome to The Teaching Curve. I'm very happy to have you here, and I'm glad we get to talk about all the work that led to your award. Thank you. Nice to see you, Jamie. Okay. So the award that I mentioned was the Deborah Gurner ISA Award for Innovative Teaching, which you received this year. Congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I'm very honored. It's a it's a wonderful thing that really does signify the amount of effort that you put into working on your teaching. So it, you should be proud of that. Yeah, uh, I'm a very happy person. I do what I love. Excellent. So the first question I always ask when we're doing these interviews is for us to help position you in your pedagogical context, which includes talking a little bit about the students at your institution as a way of letting us know who it is that you're in interaction with as a teacher. So who do you teach, Luba? Okay, so I would say teach the future, right? <laughs> so my students at my campus at Cal State San Bernardino, uh, it's a minority serving institution. Uh, most of our students are Hispanic students and especially uh, the vast majority of students are first generation students. And they, I think I'm really honored to work with people um, coming with, from this background because the people are really hardworking students, mm. uh, very motivated. Our university is very much known for social mobility. So that gives a lot of meaning to my work because I know that I can help people change their lives. And I know that in return, those people are going to change my life for better. So it's kind of a full circle for me. Fantastic. That's great. Can you tell me a little bit about um, and it, how you came to decide to invest a lot of energy in teaching? What, what spurred you to want to do that? Um, it just... You know, seeing faces of people when you explain uh, things that might make sense to you and you see those aha moments is very satisfying. And mm -hmm. I, um, I kind of always wanted to teach. I wasn't sure I want to do this in academic setting. Uh, it was one of my professors uh, who uh, kept asking, why do you came to political science class? What they want to do with that, that made me realize if I want to teach, I want to teach in a place where people choose what they want to study. Uh, compared to school, where at least where I coming from, you mm -hmm. couldn't really choose. You have to study everything. And so I really love this idea of someone comes to study topics that matter for them. And they eventually evolved into teaching uh, um, and finding the ways uh, to teach people who might not be interested in the topic. And because a lot of people, especially in international relations class, um, when they come, they cannot define what is international relations. And um, even sometimes uh, already after the class started, they might not still realize how much what they do inside of United States has 
so much impact on the world. Individual mm -hmm. students, individual people, I'm not speaking about leadership necessary, right? Not only leadership. And uh, that's in itself, I think, is, um, is fascinating uh, seeing how students reveal this uh, powers they have, they don't know about yeah. like, their role. You know, I think that's really particularly important when you're talking about the kinds of students that are at your university um, that you describe first generation students. Is there anything in particular that you think works for the students at your place that you found that really tends to resonate with students who may be coming in um, in, in th that particular context? Um, I think that um, our classes are relatively small in size, at least in my department, and this means that we as professors are very approachable. Mm. And they, I love that. I mean, sometimes uh, you have students who, who approach you and say, after the class, I had a question I didn't ask, and you can, you can answer that. So um, it's sometimes I have to teach evening classes, and the class might eight, it, uh, end at 8.40, and I'll get home at 10. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that's not a bad thing. I mean, like it, it, sometimes you have this, but the discussion after the class because you're approachable. So I think that the fact that the class is so small is a huge plus for uh, students who are first generation students. Mm -hmm. But also, um, I think um, it depends on personality of professors. You know, everyone is different. My approach is very uh, informal and uh, interactive. And I share a lot about my story, um, where I come from. I always start my class with that. And the, um, this type of, you know, bringing theory of international relations and data to support the theory, but then giving my story or stories I read about human stories that show perspective, you know, um, um, of all sides. That's something I think resonates with students. Sometimes you can see, you know, you a student that um, might have eyes down all the time and then you start to tell the story and the eyes go up and that's um you know for me it's like it's, <laughs> it I know exactly um, what you're talking about i i love that and it can happen with human stories that are either about individuals in the narratives that are having these uh conflicts for example but it can also be about stuff that you tell about yourself where you really humanize your own presence in the classroom and talk about how that you're not just a kind of a recording of information you're a person yeah. in interaction with them look my you know i kind of look at my disadvantages as advantage in the setting because i speak with a heavy accent and i'm aware of that um i wasn't born in the united states and the um so I might misspell words when I type them on the blackboard, right? Uh, so I always, when this happens, we laugh together and I tell them, so you don't have to be perfect to succeed in your life. Uh, don't stop yourself just because you might misspell a word or, I mean, like, don't. So I use this kind of thing just to show, um, you know, yeah, you don't need to be perfect to do what you love. And that's, awesome. that's, but again, I think that's a lot, there are different styles of teaching and that's my style. I know it might not work with everyone because some people would prefer something much more formal lecture time, but I usually will tell students at the very beginning that that's how I teach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if mm -hmm. you want to stay in this class, that's, that's what you get. So, but what, what's really cool about it is clearly this is uh, also uh, in in a way recognized, right? You, you won the award for innovative teaching. So th there's ways that that ISA is setting you up as the model, as a model for a way to do some of these more innovative, active things. So tell me a little bit about the kinds of things that you think contributed to winning the award. Um, I think it's not because I do one single activity or exercise. I do specialize in simulations, uh, but it's not only simulations. It's, uh, um, you know, it's uh, seeing a class and then trying to think, 
I'm going to teach today about my first class in international relations, right? About how the world is interconnected. And the students come to my class, they have no idea what is international relations. They might not be even interested in that, right? So yeah. how do I do that in a way that they can relate and connect to that? And so in this first class, I will bring um, um, a um, ribbon. And then I will start sharing information about myself, such as, for example, I speak multiple languages. And if anyone in class speaks multiple languages, they take the other part of the ribbon and continue to speak about themselves. And so eventually we connect all together, right, into the network. And then I show them the network of countries and I tell them, like, hold the networks. What's good about us having a network? What's the disadvantages of us being in network? And I tell one student, just pull it suddenly. And if that student is not prepared, and they usually shatter and fall. And so I tell you, you have to always be prepared in international relations. You are in a network. And so this kind of type of exercise is just one example. But I um, try to think, how do I explain to people who might, might have a general interest in the topic, but do not believe it as I live it, yeah. right? Uh -huh. uh, how do I make them relate and uh, become this types of thing that are uh, part of everyday life, not I come to class and they hear about that, but after the class, I go outside, I hear the news and I understand what it means. Yeah. And I understand how it will affect my community. I understand how it will affect people I care about. Um, so I can give another example, right? Globalization. Sh should I give it? <laughs> Please, that would be great. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so when we teach about when I teach about globalization and they and I ask students to um, as they came to classroom, right? They only know we're going to discuss globalization and then tell them you have five minutes to find as many things around you you have, including in your backpack, including uh, on you, your clothes, and chairs in the classroom, anything you can find and make a list where it was made at. Okay, where does the thing come from? And then they work in groups to compare their findings. Uh -huh. And then we discuss, and obviously most of the things come from um, Asia, right? And then we discuss the concepts of uh, uh, outsourcing and offshoring, and I'll explain to them how they are, right, often being critical of government policies are actually the one who participate completely themselves in all of this process that shape the government policies. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and so this is kind of things, many different exercises like this, uh, in addition to simulations, of course, along the, um, my classes. And I think that that's all together as a package, rather than, you know, one single activity. I would say an approach. That's that great. I mean, I hope, what, yeah. what I think that symbolizes it, and when you say it's an approach, is you're willing to give things a try. You're willing to experiment with things that will maybe hopefully connect with students. I, I'm sure there's times when things don't and you have to kind of reassess and say, well, what can I do? What, what didn't work? How can I make it work better next time? Absolutely, yeah, I'm taking risks all the time. And I say students that I'm taking the risk with you in the class, um, that I've never tried this type of exercise before. Okay, I usually will tell this after the exercise ended. And yep. they, um, uh, for example, I'm using Jigsaw Classroom. It's one of my favorites. Uh, favorite. And the, um, in this activity, what I do is I let students to prepare research paper in advance. Okay. And then on the, and everyone gets specific research topic on expertise, right? Let's say, for example, you will uh, investigate the um, how the uh, geopolitical competition in Arctic is an emerging national security threat. I'm going to focus on how supply chain issues are a national um, emerging threat. And then everyone on the same topic will be working together to complement their expertise. Then they're going to be reshuffled in the jigsaw groups. And in the jigsaw, right? They're going to be only one student who has expertise mm -hmm. on supply chain and only one student has expertise on the Arctic. And so now they have to teach each other 
And in the end, a representative of the group needs to pitch it to the entire classroom and we're going to vote who won the recommendations, right? right? So this is kind of activity. And uh, it took me a lot of iterations, okay, to find the way for it to work. Um, and so I just had it in my Eastern European politics class. And after that, in the briefing, I asked the students what should have been done differently. And so there, I asked them to focus on three months, um, recent development, three months, and they could not find information, okay? And so we kind of decided together that the next time I'm going to do that, I'm going to let students to focus on 12 months. Uh -huh. Okay. So it still worked, right? Even if it doesn't really uh, 100%. Um, another example is the simulations. It's the biggest risk. Okay. Yeah, what, what's so cool about that, I think, is what you get is the sense, you, you empower the students as the expert in that particular part of the larger story, but they realize that they also don't know a lot of other things, but they are wrapping their heads around in a metacognitive way, what it means to learn something, even though it's just a part of something larger. So I, I really like that idea. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, I love Jigsaw. I love Jigsaw because sometimes there's so many topics you can't teach because of the limited time, hmm. but then you can teach five topics, right? If you have 12 people in a Jigsaw group, in one time period and it's so effective because they teach each other they teach each other yeah so they listen to each other they actually share their research with each other um the disadvantage i would say that i can't let students uh choose any topic they want to right because then i have to tell them okay five of you are going to focus on this topic five of you are going to yeah. i mean you can choose which of the topics right but i have this limited set and uh, I, I do not like that part, to be honest. I yeah. want people to study what they want, but they still can choose if, if they're interested in global hunger for the emerging threat or supply chain issues, right? Different things related. That's cool. I really yeah. like that. One of the things that always comes up in this is the amount of work that it takes to come up with those kinds of um, innovative things and the investment that to many of the people who teach this stuff feels like it's extra work. So how do you talk about both the work that you put in in order to come up with the simulations and the ideas and the things like that, but also how that balance, how you try to find a balance in your own life about between teaching and, and your job and, and research and then other things in your life? It's challenging, come on fly. It's a big, big challenge. Of, um, I'm also a mom, so there is another major part in my life. And they, um, it's very difficult to find the balance and I'm still looking for it, okay? Um, oftentimes the ideas for teaching do not come from sitting in front of a computer and trying to think, mm, how am I going to teach that stuff? Mm. It's more of, you know, seeing the news and suddenly having this, that's so relevant to my class. Or oh, mm -hmm. just walking uh, outside with kids and just thinking, I can't teach that in this way. So just ideas just sometimes come to you. Um, uh, it is a lot of preparations, uh, but um, again, the some of the classes you just come and you have a conversation and more for lecture type. In other cases, you just do active learning activities. So it's um, you don't necessarily need to choose it right mm -hmm. in our field the thing is that um things so dynamic so basically you can't write a lecture ahead of time and leave it in you know uh ready forever in your files you have to revisit no matter what right and so the same with active learning activities in fact i think that um especially at the beginning of a new tenure track position, um, assistant professor, active learning helped me a lot, mm. okay? It helped me a lot because it, I could do important work rather than prepare a lecture of 75 minutes, okay? A full lecture. I could prepare a scenario and then discuss the scenario and potential um, um, alternatives to what happened by students. 
So in even some cases, to be completely honest, I used active learning both for teaching efficiency, but also for time management, okay? So I knew it could save uh, time because it would provide, a, 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 instead of, for example, um, me trying to explain, okay, when the uh, nuclear deal 2.0 came up like last, last week, yeah. right? Instead of me trying to give a lecture on all of the aspects of that and all the positive and negative of going into the agreement between the United States and Iran over nuclear weapons, right? I just simply divided class into four groups, Europeans, Americans, Iranians, and Israelis, and each one have to come up with arguments to convince Okay, Americans, whether or not, so Europeans to convince not to sign, Israelis to con uh, the opposite, Europeans to convince to renew the deal, Israelis yeah. to convince to not renew the deal, Americans to decide whether or not they're going to renew the deal, and Iranians to decide whether or not they're going to abide by the deal if United States reveals, right? right. So in, in, in this example, okay, when we had to discuss the scenario and all the Okay, calculations, it gave me so much information from the student reactions and, 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 and they could, could understand what I'm talking about. So sometimes it saves time. It, you know, what's interesting about that, I mean, I'm, I'm with you, I think that that's valuable, but it's risky because they may end up, you know, the group may come up with things that are just wrong um, or you know, misinterpretations about things. And so it, I could imagine somebody who is much more of a lecture oriented person saying, yeah, but you might not get the right interpretation of these things. I love when that happens. I actually want this to happen. I don't want them to be right. If they're right and know everything, why did they come to my class, <laughs> right? I want them to be wrong. I want them to tell them, think again. How can you, okay, what the uh, opponents of this you would say to you? So I want them to be challenged. And I always tell my students, if you feel comfortable in a classroom, try to think about a different classroom. Okay, I'm not speaking about, um, you know, being offensive, but you need to feel challenged, right? You need to feel that. You need to feel, uh, I love to feel challenge myself as students. I still do. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so uh, when they asked me a question, I don't know answer to, and I was, hmm, I didn't think about that. Thank you. I'll check that. That happens a lot. Okay, and I, again, I tell them, you see, you don't have to know everything. Okay, to do what you love. It's the learning process all the time. Yeah. And so, yeah, I want them to be wrong. Not always, but, uh, you know, sometimes active learning is risky and the, um, it's um, uh, time consuming, uh, but it's also challenging. It makes you feel, uh, for me at least, it makes me feel alive, dynamic. It makes me get immediate feedback. And the... Um, Interesting when I ask students who graduated, like uh, if they remember anything from the class, they would usually remember simulations. They would usually remember the activities. So not small details, right? But the activity itself. And that's why I, I keep doing that. And sometimes I'm mad at myself, I'm doing that. Uh, but after the activity, based on the feedback, I say, okay, I should do it again. I was right to do it this time. I can't think of a better way to end the conversation than talking about the empowerment and the joy of students get from doing the kinds of learning that they do in your classes. That's fantastic. And me too. <laughs> okay. I, I, I have a lot of, um, you know, satisfaction of, of knowing that students come to the class and, and, and they interested in the topics of big world, you know, outside of the classroom and, and then can use this actually information that they get that, to bring it all the way back. Fantastic. Luba, thank you so much for taking the time yeah. to chat with us today. I had a lot of fun and uh, I look forward to seeing you next year in San Francisco. I'm, I'm going to be there, I hope. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. The Teaching Curve podcast is made available on the ISA Professional Resource Center under the auspices of the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative. You can send feedback or suggestions for future interviews to teachingcurve at isonet.org and follow us on Twitter at Teaching Curve. Be sure to look for forthcoming pedagogy program at the Global Regional Conference in Iframe, Morocco in June. Thanks all for joining us again on The Teaching Curve. And remember, learn something every time you teach.